Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media for our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, a, a national security think tank in Washington, DC. You may find this to be strange. Why is a national security think tank uh, introducing this session that you're going to have with Bob Gates? Uh, well, it's because we consider civics education to be a national security imperative. Uh, I think we've seen in recent days a great concern about whether Americans comprehend the importance of this remarkable institution that we've inherited, a democracy. Do we understand it? Uh, do we know how precious it is and what we have to do to sustain it? We've been focused on this for several years, and of course, it's all become a greater focus in recent months. And we were very pleased that Secretary Bob Gates agreed that he would lead a session with all of you in this very important dialogue. My role is strictly to say this is not an education issue alone. This is a national security imperative. And I really am grateful that you are here to listen to this remarkable man, Secretary Bob Gates. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamry. Uh, we are so pleased to be able to host this conversation as part of the Civics Now Policy Summit. Civics Now has been an outstanding partner in our strategic dialogue on civics as a national security imperative, especially Louise Dubay and Sean Healy. Uh, their passion around promoting civic education is so inspiring, as is the passion that we've heard from a wide range of national security professionals that we've had the privilege to talk with over the course of this initiative at CSIS. A key goal for our initiative is to bring the sense of urgency to this issue of civic education that we attach to other national security issues. And I can think of no one better suited to talk about the national security imperative of civics than our guest this afternoon. Hard to know what title to use for him. I tend to think of, of you, uh, Dr. Gates, as Director Gates, uh, because that's the capacity in which I first met you back in the early 90s when I was a young attorney in the general counsel's office at CIA and you were the director of central intelligence. I was working for Elizabeth Rinskoff Parker. And I remember particularly arriving early for a meeting uh, once with, that she asked me to accompany uh, with you and you came out and I was the only one there and you graciously brought me into your office and we chatted for a few minutes till everyone arrived. Um, very impressionable for a, for a young attorney. Uh, you joined the CIA, of course, uh, in 1966, and, uh, and, and Director Gates worked for six presidents during 27 years as an intelligence officer and was the only career officer in CIA's history to rise from being an entry-level employee to become the director. But another title that many think of you uh, is Secretary Gates. Uh, uh, Secretary Gates is the only Secretary of Defense in U.S. history to be asked to remain in office by a newly elected president, spanning Presidents Bush and Obama. Uh, in fact, he served eight presidents across both parties. And on Secretary Gates' last day in office, of course, President Barack Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. But he also received the Presidential Citizens Medal, relevant to today's discussion, awarded to individuals who have performed exemplary deeds or services or his or, or country or fellow citizens. Of his many, many medals and awards, there's another one I was particularly impressed by, and that was way back when, when you were graduating from William & Mary, the Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award, given to honor splendid characteristics of heart, mind, and helpfulness to others. Uh, we could even call you President Gates, since you were president of Texas A&M University and president of the Boy Scouts of America, having been an Eagle Scout yourself. Um, or your current title, Chancellor of William & Mary. But for, dis for today today's discussion, uh, I will use Dr. Gates since our emphasis is on education. Speaking of William & Mary, uh, you once said that William & Mary instilled in you a calling to serve, a sense of duty to community and to country. 
Uh, I have no doubt that William and Mary strengthened that calling, but uh, I have a sense that you had other informative experiences earlier in your life, including the Boy Scouts. And um, Elizabeth Rinskoff Parker, who served as your general counsel, shared with me a story about the inspiration that you derived from uh, from JFK. And I wondered if you uh, would share some of those early experiences uh, that helped inform your sense of civic responsibility and civic literacy. Sure. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Suzanne. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, uh, I would I would uh, say three things about my background that um, contributed. One was uh, certainly my experience growing up in Kansas and and uh, being in the Boy Scouts and uh, the Scouts then and now. Uh, one of the requirements for to become an Eagle is to earn merit badges and citizenship in the home, citizenship in the community, and citizenship in the nation. And uh, and those those really sparked an interest for me. When I went to Wave and Mary, I actually uh, was. Uh, wanted to be a, a neurological surgeon. And I've often said, God only knows how many lives have been saved by my becoming CIA director and secretary of defense instead of a doctor. But when I got to Williamsburg, uh, which is clearly where the first steps toward American independence took place, and graduates of William and Mary include uh, uh, James Monroe and Thomas Jefferson, and George Washington got his first official job through William & Mary as a, he was licensed as a surveyor and, and was chancellor of the college for that matter, um, right after independence. So William and & Mary and, and Williamsburg are sort of, uh, there's an aura of American history that, that, that we began there. And, and, um, and so just walking the, the walks uh, that those, uh, those founders uh, walked and having that experience really was inspirational. And then, uh, and then I, was, um, I was a freshman in college when um, President Kennedy um, made his inaugural speech and, and said, or I was a senior in high school actually, but he made his inaugural speech and, and said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And, and actually one of my regrets is that in my uh, over 50 years of uh, serving those eight presidents, there actually were only two that uh, lauded public service as, as an admirable thing to do and, and encouraged young people to go into public service. And President Kennedy was one. And the other was George H. W. Bush, uh, uh, our 41st president. Uh, but Kennedy uh, really inspired me, and and uh, between between his inspiration, the atmosphere in Williamsburg, and a D in freshman calculus, my major got changed to to history, and uh, and and the rest is history, as they say. But I I actually. Um, hadn't planned to make a career of public service, I, except in the way I did, I, I actually wanted to teach in college. Uh, um, but when I was offered a job uh, by CIA in, in grad school, I was at the Russian and East European Institute at Indiana University, and when I was offered a job by CIA, I thought, told my wife, well, that sounds like it'll be fun, I'll do that for a couple of years, and then I'll go teach. And uh, somehow the teaching, at least in the classroom, uh, never actually happened. Well, you did manage to get back into academia. Uh, and of course, we are very grateful. I, I, I know you meant it sort of tongue in cheek, but, um, but I suspect there are many lives that were saved and certainly altered by your uh, public service. So thank you for that. Um, you know, you talk about these formative experiences. The emphasis of this summit, of course, is on promoting uh, K through 12 civic education, the federal government invests about $54 per student on STEM, which is, we all know, important to our national security, and about five cents per student on civics education, uh, because I think it is not recognized as a national security imperative. You, as a national security leader and as an educator, have had a first-hand, you know, up-close opportunity to see how important civics is. Do you, do you agree that it's a that it is really a vital to our national security? 
I think it's imperative, and, and frankly, I think that um, the, the level of public discourse, the uh, ugly nature of uh, the public debate today, um, the divisiveness in our country, uh, in my view, are a reflection uh, in at least some part of the absence of civics education, um, particularly in middle school and high school, but especially high school, when kids are old enough to understand um, some of the intricacies of how government works. And I think, I think part of it is, you know, everybody has to take American history, but, you know, the teachers are required to cover the entirety of American history in a given amount of time. And so you do, they do cover, you know, the, the framing of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the formation of the American government and so on. But civics is not really a part of the teaching of American history of how the government works uh, and the role of the citizen in making government work and in holding politicians accountable and the importance of participation uh, uh, and, and just the, how, how important it is that there be a civil dialogue in discussing the issues that come before us. You know, several of the founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams and others, all wrote very specifically that the democratic experience, the, the the building of the republic uh, or its sustainment depended entirely on having an educated public. And by that, they didn't mean just STEM. They meant an, a public that understood the nature of their government uh, and, and the role of the citizen in the government and the engagement of student of citizens uh, in their government and in the operation of government. And and frankly, I think the absence uh, or the disappearance, I should say, of the teaching of civics, um, particularly in high school, uh, I think has had a really deleterious effect on the country. Yeah, you, um, you talk about the importance of civics teaching us about obligations and responsibilities of, uh, of individuals and their fellow citizens. Uh, I think very yeah, I closely- would just, I would just interject. I would just interject there, Suzanne. I, I often make the comment in, in speeches and, and, and public appearances that I make, we hear all the time about our rights as citizens. Everyone talks about our rights. Virtually no one, including our political leaders, talk about the obligations of citizenship. Yeah, I, I often, I am so struck these days, particularly of, of you know, thinking of, by, and for the people, right? Government of, by, and for the people. Uh, and I think you're right. We've focused a lot on the for the people uh, and, and not nearly enough on the uh, of and by, that, that we are, that the beauty of democracy is that connection between the governed and the government um, and that we have that obligation. And one of the things I think uh, that has led to a decline in trust in democracy and, 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 and appreciation for democracy is a sense that among so many Americans that, um, that, they, that they are helpless, that the government is not responsive uh, and, and that they cannot make it responsive. And I think, in fact, the strength of democracy, a key strength of democracy is its capacity for change. So, uh, can you talk a bit about how civics can help educate Americans to be more effective agents of change, to empower Americans to be those voices, uh, you know, whether it's in national security or other places, the, the importance of, of, of combating, for example, disinformation from Russia that would lead us to believe that our system is irrevocably broken by empowering individuals to understand how they can make our institutions more responsive and more accountable. Well, I think I think one of the one of the objectives of civics education is underscoring for uh, people the importance of participation, um, of voting, and of engagement. And frankly, one of the reasons that we're in the real bind we're in nationally right now is that uh, 
particularly in, in the political parties' primaries, there actually is very small participation. And so relatively extreme people in both the Republican and Democratic parties can dominate the primaries so that come November and the elections, a lot of people who haven't been engaged in the process say, how did we end up with these candidates? Well, the reason they didn't, end, they ended up with those candidates was their lack of engagement uh, six or eight or nine months before when the decisions were being made about who the candidates would be. And so this is why engagement is so important because the more people who are engaged, the broader the range of views that are going to be, uh, are going to be uh, brought together. And, and, you know, I think one of the fundamental lessons of, of civics education uh, is helping people understand that, that the American system only works through compromise. The Constitution itself is a bundle of really big compromises, and that and and that people have to understand that some battles they'll win and some battles they'll lose, and they come back and they fight those battles again. But it is nobody always gets their way all the time in a real democracy or in a Republican form of government as we have small R. And so I think one of the big lessons of of civic civic education civics education is, is uh, the importance of engagement. And, and I think that, this, that there's a direct connection, in my view, between the lack of engagement on the part of a lot of Americans, because I think most Americans, uh, by far a majority, are probably center, center left, center right. They're not on the extremes. And, and when you have the kind of polarization and paralysis we do today because of the lack of engagement of the broad citizenry, it has real national security implications. It creates the opportunity for disinformation by the Russians and the Chinese. It inhibits, it, it has an impact internationally that the United States can't govern itself. Uh, this is a big theme of the Chinese right now. The United States doesn't, can't, its model of government doesn't work. And they point to all the things they've accomplished in terms of infrastructure and bringing people out of poverty and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a direct thread, it seems to me, between the lack of engagement of a broad cross-section of Americans in the day-to-day -day life of the, of the Republic in terms of public uh, engagement and our polarization, paralysis, and the consequences of that in terms of our national security. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, I also want to uh, uh, talk with you about, in addition to the importance to our national security of civics for the population at, at large, um, the importance of making sure that our men and women in the national security roles uh, in government, in the military and civilian national security, have a solid grounding in that civics education um, in, in not just what the laws are, but why. Why do we have posse comitatus? Why do we have uh, a, a system of enumerated powers for the federal government, et cetera? And what does that mean for them and their mission? Um, did you, do you have any examples from your experience in your national security roles, good or bad, of, of sort of the you know, degree to which our workforce has adequate civics grounding. I think I think where it is best, where it is found at its best uh, in the military is in the professional military education system. Uh, you know, uh, when you when you go into basic training, there is there isn't a lot of classroom, there isn't a lot of classroom time. There's there's a lot of time spent on. What does it mean on, on the values of our services in terms of honor and loyalty and duty uh, in addition to the skills that they pick up? <clears throat> but in terms of sort of the historical role of our military, posse comitatus and all of those things, there isn't a lot of that in, the, in, the, in basic training. But where you do find a lot of emphasis on our American political system and how it works and the role of the military, is really in the uh, in the officer training programs from from the commissioning process right on up through the uh, the programs for brand new generals uh, and admirals, 
so there is a lot, I think, uh, uh, that, a, that relates to civics and the role of the military in our democracy, uh, in the officer programs and in the, and in the um, non-commissioned officer programs. Um, they don't necessarily get it when they come, when they first get in, other than the sense of, other than the, the teaching about duty and about honor and about loyalty, including loyalty to the Constitution. I'm, I, I suspect that a lot of those young men and women come out of basic training not having a really thorough understanding of the Constitution and, and what it means for them, other than the fact that they have a duty to the Constitution and not to any particular politician. Texas A&M has the largest ROTC, one of the largest ROTC programs in the country. Um, you know, should we be putting more of the civics, basic kind of civics literacy, uh, even in our ROTC programs? I think that there actually is a fair amount of that in the ROTC programs. Uh, I know that A&M has a very extensive leadership training program uh, within the Corps of Cadets, and, and that, is, that very much gets at a lot of the civics-related uh, issues and so on. And I think, I think in most colleges and universities, uh, there's quite a bit of this uh, in the ROTC program. So I think in both I mean, I remember a long time ago when I was in officer training school in the Air Force, there was a lot of classroom time and a lot of it was not just on the history of the Air Force and so on, but it was on uh, the Constitution and on uh, the role of the military in a democracy and so on. So I think, I think in ROTC and the officer training programs right up through general officer, we've got a pretty good curriculum uh, in that respect. I, I think there's so many things that have to be taught in a very limited period of time during basic training. I'm not sure how much more you can squeeze in. Um, I mean, one of the things that they have had that they have had to add in recent years is our real segments on sexual assault, on racism, and so on. And and so, you know, my own view is it 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 would be worth at least one lecture <laughs> and basic training about you know, the, the, the role of the military in a constitution and the role we have to play. And frankly, I think, I think we can use the events of January 6th as a springboard for that discussion um, and, and kind of why it almost all fell apart uh, at that point and, and how, how dangerous that, that time was. Well, you have certainly done your part, both in your formal roles uh, to advance the education of the public and in your willingness to be part of conversations like this one today, um, I, you know, and the books that you have written and the insights that you have shared, all of which uh, really do significantly advance uh, the civic literacy of, the, of our population and of our national security community. So I just wanna thank you for that as well. And so grateful for your time today. Uh, I know how busy you are and I very much appreciate your um, willingness to be part of our effort to promote civics education in this country. So thank you so much.